I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And, and this, this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where us, Claire Parker and Ashley Hamilton, are reading the books so that you don't have to. Because let me tell you guys, these books are thick and bland. <laughs> and so we take them, we eat them for you, and we baby bird feed them back to you with the love in our hearts. A little bit more genetic material. <laughs> and that makes them, frankly, digestible. And this week, I would like to thank Jiminy's, the maker of sustainable dog food and treats made with cricket protein that is better for the environment using less land and water to produce. Cricket protein is a superfood that is delicious, nutritious, and easy to digest for dogs. Save 25% on your first purchase. Go to Jiminy's.com slash worm25 and use the code worm25 at checkout. And... Thank you to Solo Stove for sponsoring our show. Upgrade your backyard with the Solo Stove fire pit and create story-worthy moments without the fireside fumes. Right now, you can get big discounts on all fire pits during Solo Stove's 4th of July sale and use the promo code WORM at solostove.com for an extra $10 off. And join me in thanking Credit Karma for supporting our show. Credit Karma, apply with more confidence today. Ready to apply? Head to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to see personalized offers. And thanks to Freshly for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Freshly has delicious, fresh, healthy meals ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. Stop stressing about dinner. Now through July 10th, Freshly is offering our listeners a special 4th of July deal. $150 off your first six orders when you go to Freshly.com slash worm. And Claire, what's fresh in your life? What would you title <laughs> last week's chapter if it were a memoir? I would call it the end of an era. Okay, which era? The era of my apartment. I don't know if you guys are new listeners or if you know this or not, but I have lived in the same apartment my entire New York City life, like since college, and I am obsessed with it. It's kind of a core part of knowing me because I had like 30 roommates over the course of eight years. So for many years, I was just like constantly finding a new roommate and sometimes it was a hit and sometimes it was a big old miss. <laughs> and I just like was so proud of it because it's a really good deal. And Shouts out to Erica if you're listening. <laughs> my favorite of Claire's roommates ever. And I just... Mac yeah. included. <laughs> And it was just like a huge part of me being like, I have this great deal and I'll never leave, blah, blah, blah. Well, let me tell you, they have changed management hands and things are changing. There is a war a brewing. <laughs> These people took over the building June 1st. My downstairs roommates moved out June 2nd. Do you think it's possible that their lease was up? Not only was their lease up, but they were not even given the option to renew it because the rent doubled. So they didn't even send them the next level of rent because they were like, we would never have people in this apartment who would even thought to be paying how little you're paying. <laughs> and then it got bitted up really hard. So our rent is all about to double as soon as our leases go up. But on top of that, they're like waging war with the tenants. So... First of all, they put the ugliest things in the stairs I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to put a photo of it on Instagram because I need to explain to you guys how crazy it looks. They came and they just put brass covers on any stair that had a rip in the carpet, which is not every stair. So like six of the 20 stairs, and I just have this like ugly, it looks like a hole puncher that you'd put in your binder. Does that make sense if you taped yeah. that to the ground? And it's just random. And I watched the guy do it. I'm like, why are you doing this? And he was like, so that you can't trip and fall and sue. And I was like, we promise we won't. We never have. We've all been here forever. Bug used to love playing with the carpet string. And now it's gone. And I guess it's all Bug's fault. And the other thing they've done is I guess someone complained that the, like there wasn't hot water one day. So now they've put in a hot water heater that gives you the range of boiling to like third degree burns. Every time I get into the shower, I have to go in in a protective suit. I can't explain it. It's so hot now that I might die. I'm just like a little linguine in there, just cooking like a noodle. Oh, my God. <laughs> boiling like a lobster. It's so painful to shower. And it turns out having boiling hot water is worse than having very cold water because, one, you can live through, and the yeah. other might leave you nothing but organs. <laughs> and I'm just like, I get it. I'm leaving. I'll go. Maybe they thought when you shower you wanted to wash your whole skin off. <laughs> they were like, repent for your sins. Go to hell, bitch. <laughs> It's okay. Everybody has to move at some point. I couldn't live in that little apartment forever. It's fine. Unless you could. I could have lived in that apartment forever. I, I don't know. At one point you were like, I think until I have my first child and that child can walk, I'll live in this apartment. That was my plan. I know. But that's not forever. I did assume that at one point my child would be able to walk oh, yeah. <laughs> before the end of eternity. <laughs> At one point was like, well, maybe then I just rent the apartment downstairs and give the baby the downstairs apartment and put a little like baby talker in there or whatever. Why is that different than a house with two floors? Why? I don't know. People hate city parents. But anyway, I guess that won't happen now. Ashley. Get the baby in an apartment nearby. I'm just saying maybe like let go of your patriarchal notions of what the nuclear family looks like. Why do we all have to live together? Ashley. 
Yes, Claire? If you were a celebrity and you were writing a memoir, what would last week's chapter be called? Let go and let God. Oh, yeah, you're finding God? <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, really working on letting go and hoping that the people who are fucking dickheads on the internet find God. <laughs> oh, so not for you. You don't need God, but others do. <laughs> I know we try not to address the haters, but every now and then a little bit of bullshit creeps in and you get to me. You get to not only me, but also my dad who will call me and be like, why are people being mean to you on the internet? And then I'll be like, I know, I just don't want to talk about it. And then he'll be like, no, but let me read you what they said. And I'll be like, stop reading me the comments again. <laughs> it doesn't help when I hear them more <laughs> from my dad. <laughs> It was like a really um, intense phone call. I had to like scream and be like, just stop telling me. And he's like, no, but have you seen this one? And I was like, yes, I've seen them all and they hurt my feelings. And I do want to say people always like get mad at us for not wanting negative feedback on our reviews. We are welcome to feedback in our comments, in our DMs. DMs in email. Our email is public information. I think that if there is a discussion to be had, we're happy to have it. If you're just going to like write mean shit about me in a place where I have no way to respond, I don't know. Go fuck yourself. I don't understand what that's for and why you would do it, especially when it's like so mean that it makes no sense. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so here are some common criticisms I get. My face or my voice just go away. You don't have to listen to me. It's so easy to not listen to me. There's lots of people in my life who don't listen to me. In that conversation with my dad, he wasn't listening to me. He's my own dad and we were in a phone call. So like, not listening to me is easy as pie, to be honest. So the fact that you're not doing it really says something about you. If you don't like the way that we talk about books in general, there are other podcasts that cover celebrity memoirs. You can very easily block and unsubscribe on all platforms and you will forget that we exist. That's the thing is like when I don't like something on the internet, if you block and just never see it again, you will forget about them. And I would fucking love for you to forget that I exist. That would make me so happy. Second of all, or third of all, I don't really, really know where we are. I think you're up to three. For the people who say that I am not smart enough for this subject matter, that's like a very common thing I've been seeing is people calling me stupid. I'm not your doctor, okay? <laughs> I am a comedian who started a podcast. I've twice been fired from social media jobs, and I have a mid-level liberal arts degree. Who were you expecting to, like, handle this subject matter? If you don't think I'm good enough to do it, like, go listen to someone else do it. Try it yourself. I truly don't care, but, like, stop expecting me to have the fucking foresight of a physicist. Because <laughs> I simply can't see the future like they can. <laughs> Uh, from my business partner. You love to hear it. Anyway, shall we get into another woman who's oft been criticized for being a dumb fucking bitch? <laughs> Our comedy forefather, Amy Schumer. The girl with the lower back tattoo. The woman who paved the way for all other slutty white women. I want to say this book starts off not strong with a deeply timely reference. I was saying to Ashley, I was like, this book didn't age as poorly as I thought it would because I think of her as so problematic and someone who's said so many things that I couldn't have even imagined what she write in here. And after Tina Fey's book, I was like, God, this is going to be bad reference after bad reference. And then I was like, oh, it actually didn't age as badly as I was prepared to see it. And Ashley goes, the title is literally a reference to like a very specific moment in time <laughs> in pop culture. And I was like, well, true. <laughs> So it opens up with a note to her readers where she really serves us up on a platter exactly what this book is going to be, which is nothing, not an autobiography. This book isn't my autobiography. I will write one of those when I'm 90. I just turned 35, so I have a long way to go until I'm memoir worthy. But for now, I wanted to share these stories from my life as a daughter, sister, friend, comedian, actor, girlfriend, one night stand, employee, employer, lover, fighter, hater, pasta eater, and wine drinker. That's the kind of humor we can expect from these pages, to be honest with you. I also want to clarify that this book has no self-help info or advice for you. I'm a flawed fuck up and I haven't figured anything out. So I have no wisdom to offer. What I can help with is showing you my mistakes and my pain and my laughter. So that's what she's promising. Nothing. And I guess if you say I came away with nothing, then she gave you what you, she promised you. And so in that sense, me and Ashley can have no valid criticisms because we got what we paid for. Which is nothing. <laughs> she, just to contextualize this book, is 41 now. She was born June 1st, 1981. She did write this book when she was about 35. It came out in 2016. So we start off strong with an open letter to her vag. And when you say strong. I mean, it seems like she has a powerful vag. And again, this book is all over the place in terms of 
Sometimes it's a paragraph. Sometimes it's a listicle. And I know we criticize a lot of books for being a collection. And clearly that is a style of book. And we just have to deal with the fact that an entire publishing division has told certain people that they're allowed to just write a listicle about what's in their bag. (laughs) Or this or that. And we just have to get on board. But this book, more than any other book, feels so inconsistent not just in tone, but in content, and then also in form. I will say there are four chapters that it feels like she wanted to write. Like, these are the topics that she was hoping to tackle with a book. She wrote those four chapters, and then she had to fill in book. So she went through her notes and was like, okay, what didn't work on stage because it needed a little bit more exposition? And she wrote those into chapters or essays or little listicles or chunks. And then... She just sat there and was like, what, what else is over there? Table? Let me write about table. <laughs> so as we said, it starts off strong with an open letter to my vagina, which just starts with, first of all, I'm sorry. Second of all, you're welcome. I know I've put you through a lot. I've had hot wax poured on you and hair ripped from you by strangers. And she's like, I've given you UTIs, yeast infections. I've also had people like really finger you badly, but I've also had sex with some hot people. So you're welcome. So what do you say? Let's grab a beer together. Okay, fine. Nothing with yeast and you're buying. And that's about it. I said, like, I didn't find this book unfunny just because I didn't even feel like it was trying often. But then I look back and I go, okay, well, that was a joke. Okay, fine. Nothing with yeast and you're buying. But I have to say something about this book, like not a word of it stuck with me. That's the thing is you were saying that you didn't think it was trying to be funny. I do think it was trying to be funny. I think it just falls so flat that sometimes it's hard to tell. Like there were certain lines in this book where I was like, I literally can't tell if that's sarcasm or if she feel like I just don't know what it was or if it was just a sentence face value it is what it is in that sense it didn't grate on me the way a Josh Peck and Anna Kendrick grated on me because I didn't feel the swings and the misses which I think is probably a plus the last thing you want for a comedy book is to be an active bomb yeah to feel the whiffs but I also didn't feel the laughs. <laughs> I felt nothing. <laughs> and so then we move on to my only one night stand. And this is where she clarifies. I've only had one one night stand in my life. Yes, one. I know. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone who thinks I walk around at all times with a margarita in one hand and a dildo in the other. Maybe the misunderstanding comes from the fact that on stage I grouped together all my wildest, worst sexual memories, which is a grand total of about five experiences over the course of 35 years. Yes, that is where the misunderstanding comes from. <laughs> that is a huge misunderstanding because you have pioneered slutty girl comedy like she really did get up there and be like I'm gross and I fuck and I'm gonna write jokes about exclusively that yeah and so to be like people think I fuck randos all the time it's like well because you kind of said you did yeah that was like your whole persona (laughs) and I do think the problem with this book is it feels extremely reactionary to that morning's moment I think a great memoir, I mean, obviously we've been toiling through a lot of these. And so I have like a working, growing definition of like what makes a great memoir. And I do think you have to be able to hold in you at once all the versions of yourself and all the ways you've felt. And also learning from past mistakes and being able to attribute them to how you feel right now. And knowing that this, how you feel right now might not be how you feel in a few years time too. Like that's what you need in order to make one of these memoirs that you write at 35, I think. Well, because I think that's one of the things that dates memoirs so hard is not even necessarily like the timely references, but the way that they're so enmeshed in one month's feeling. Yes. The goalpost kept moving until today. And this is where I'm sticking my flag emotionally and maturity wise. I think a good memoir has to have this sense that everything wavers. (laughs) Everything is constantly moving. This feels very much like coming from the place of she became so famous and I do want to say as a comedian I mean I think you hope that you'll become a Chris Rock but nobody actually thinks they will there are really only five or six mainstream comedians on earth right now and it's like and there's only probably three famous female comedians I mean I would say in like the history of comedy there have been truly just a handful of famous female comedians and I do think this book is coming from this place for Amy Schumer where she accidentally crafted this persona that she was being held accountable for and I understand why you'd be like oh fuck I don't want everyone in the world calling me a slut all the time but also it's like okay well you did there is something very 
tricky about kind of having this idea that you made all this stand up based on being like, I'm not ashamed and you're allowed to be yourself and be sexual and be a mess and don't be embarrassed about it. And then the second chapter in your book is, by the way, I'm not a sexual mess. I swear to God, I'm actually like a really put together person. And then the point of this story is I've only even had one one night stand and it actually was perfect. And I was treated like a queen and I came every time and I loved it and I was in control. Came and I- they like fucked a bunch and they came, they each came a bunch of times and he was like her picture perfect man like this chapter is about meeting him on an airplane and how she has a thing for redheads and she has a thing for gap teeth and he was like British with red hair and a gap in his front teeth and he was so nice and quote he was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen I was immediately turned on just looking at him quick side note that never fucking happens and then just by coincidence they're sitting next to each other on a plane and then he hits her up and she never said anything sexually forward before but she emails him this kind of like sexy little quip and he comes over and they have perfect sex and he wants more and she says don't give me your number like let's just leave it at this he tries to hit her up a few months later and again she's like no that was my one perfect night stand and I'm not gonna ruin it with more yeah and I do think that she really waffles constantly between being like very sexually progressive and honestly regressive if that's the mm-hmm. word she's talking about like meeting a guy at a show and how she's never done that and she says I'm not in this for the dick I enjoy sex the normal amount and most of the time it's with someone I'm dating and I just lie there in happy baby pose making it sound like I'm having a good time I mean that's like a not good thing to say <laughs> about sex to be like oh yeah you just lay there and let them do their thing like that's not good information to spread <laughs> yeah because then later she talks about being very sexually empowered so it is back and forth and I do think you'd be allowed to feel betrayed if you loved Amy because you felt that she was like representing your experiences and then the number one thing she wants to clarify is that actually that's not who she is at all <laughs> Anyway, so. And then the next chapter is I am an introvert. I am an introvert. I know what you're thinking. What the fuck, Amy? You just told us you hooked up with a stranger in Tampa and now you're claiming to be shy. You're not shy. You're a loud, boozy animal. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes that's true, but I am, without a doubt, a classic textbook introvert. Okay, textbook? Uh, Yeah, I wouldn't call it textbook. I mean, Mac is a textbook introvert and he has never once in his life gotten on stage for thousands of people. (laughs) And he hasn't even attempted to do so. This is one of your big pet peeves, which I will say I have fallen quite victim to. And then when you said what you're about to say, it did clarify for me. (laughs) Okay, so she talks about, I'll go through what she says and I'll give you my hot take on it. She goes, being an introvert doesn't mean you're shy. It means you enjoy being alone. Not just enjoy it, you need it. If you're a true introvert, other people are basically energy vampires. You don't hate them. You just have to be strategic about when you expose yourselves to them. And then she says, when you're a performer, especially a female one, everyone assumes you enjoy being on all the time. That couldn't be further from the truth for me or any of the people I am close to. The unintentional training I received when I was little was that because I was a girl and an actor, I must love being pleasant and making everyone smile and feel comfortable all the time. I think all little girls are trained this way. After about two hours of small talk and formalities, I need to hide in a bathroom. I had nothing left to give or say, and I felt the unbearable sensation that I was treading water. Okay, so my theory here is, she is for sure an extrovert. I don't know. It's like a very extroverted thing to do to do stand up. And it's a super social art form. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's not even like playing music or something. You're hanging out at comedy clubs all the time. You're out and about. It's a very social experience. I think what she's doing is she's tiring herself out, which is something I do. Like I'm definitely an extrovert and I go out to the bars and I'm like screaming so loud at the top of my lungs <laughs> with every fiber of my be- Like I'm such a tight, intense screamer that after about two hours, even if it's only 9 p.m., I have to go home and take a nap because I'm, I'm pooped. Yeah. Okay. So I had never really thought of that because I do like spending time alone, especially when I've been out and about a lot. And it is just because I tire myself out. Even if you're an extrovert who like gets energy from being out and about and seeing people and doing things, Mm -hmm. you still have a normal human need to rest. And I forget about that. One of the examples she gives in this is not liking small talk with like a random person who's like, what do you do? And she says she's a comedian. And then he's like, oh, do you know this comedian? Like sometimes when you say I'm a comedian, people ask you really annoying questions. And it's not introverted to not like that yeah and and so I was thinking like with bug bug is a little energetic cuckoo bird and (laughs) when she goes to the dog park she's running around and running around and she runs around so hard sometimes she goes home and falls asleep nobody would say (laughs) nobody would say she's an unenergetic dog you would say she's so energetic that she wears herself out and I do think what she strikes on here is this idea that women are told that they have to be people pleasing and they have to be pleasant and they have to get along with everyone and you're so afraid of being rude and especially if you do have this label of performer and funny like you feel that if you aren't actively making everyone laugh all the time people are going to hate you and that yeah. is an exhausting feeling 
to also, experience. Also, I do think that there is something that people forget, and that's that, like, you can like social interactions and like being out and about and still have some social anxiety. Like, you can still be insecure. You can still be like, are the yeah. people at this party going to like me? And that's not necessarily introversion. You're an extrovert who has hang-ups. Yeah, and I guess I think it's, like, the most extroverted thing of all time to try to be, like, once in a while, I have coffee alone. I need to, like, psychologically explain why because if there's not, like, an introverted reason for why I like that, then I'm a freak and a loser. <laughs> to be, like, I have to give this a label. Otherwise, I was just alone, and that's inexplicable. <laughs> that's the most extroverted thought process of all time. <laughs> anyway, so this next chapter is a real fucking wild ride that kind of undoes this whole ass book for me. <laughs> It was definitely a hard way to start a book, and I almost wish she had not either not included it at the beginning or built up some goodwill. This book, the order of it truly is, if it is intentional, someone fucked up. I truly need to believe that they, like, wrote the name of every chapter on a next card and threw it up in the air and then collected them and were like, that's the order we're putting them in the book. Because if this was purposeful, it is bad. Yeah, I think because she tries so hard to stay away from being an autobiography, she doesn't put anything really in a chronological order, which is fine, but there's also not a thematic order to anything. There's not an emotional order. And so she starts out here with what it's like to be rich now, which I don't know is like the most likable thing you can say. So she starts talking about how her family was super rich when she was young, and then they lost quote unquote everything. But when she talks about what her childhood was like after they lost everything, it doesn't seem that poor. Yeah, she says, quote, but to be honest, I never felt poor even when we were. I always had enough money for lunch and to go on field trips with my class. I was always well provided for. We would go to the occasional Broadway show or take a road trip to somewhere with trees and a lake. And then she goes, I drove a shitty car, but at least I had a car. I, I couldn't have expensive clothes, but I always had new things. Broadway is fancy. So basically, her dad made a ton of money because he had a European luxury baby furniture store. And she says they were rolling in dough. It was on the Upper East Side. It was the first of its kind. She was born in Manhattan, and they moved out to a fancy suburb of Long Island. And then when she was about eight or nine, other stores started selling fancy European baby furniture, and they lost everything. There's also later talks of they had, like, a baby shoe store that nobody ever went into. And then, not to spoiler alert it, but she'll casually mention that her dad was a horrible alcoholic, and I am like, well, I wonder if that played into anything. I wonder if that had an effect on his business. But she, as you'll see, doesn't hold her dad accountable for anything that he's ever done in his life. So they lose everything at eight or nine. But she even says, even after we lost everything, my dad always drove a convertible. And you're kind of like, what was everything? How much was everything? She has this really funny line about being really rich where she says, I had some extravagant rich person things as a little kid. We moved out of the city to a nice suburb on Long Island when I was five where we would eat lobster once a week and smoked fish for Sunday breakfast or as we called it jewing out hard on lobster nights my mom would bring the live ones home from the grocery store and put them on the kitchen floor for my brother sister and me to play with I just want to clarify if you're jewing out you're probably not eating shellfish <laughs> I was jewing out hard pouring milk on meat <laughs> she also has this funny line about a couple years ago, before I had real money, I asked Judd Apatow if it was fun being rich. And he explained to me that once you become rich, you find out all the good things in life are free. He said you can buy a house, good sushi and CDs, but that's about it. A house is like not a small thing to have to your name. I do feel like to be like, listen, having money is fine. You own property. You don't live in fear. <laughs> you have security and food. <laughs> but besides that, it's not going to buy you like good laughs. And I think somebody who is hungry and housing insecure would be like, well, I would, I'll take the house. Then. <laughs> I do think true wealth is the belief that money doesn't change anything. Once you get above the point where your finances matter, yeah, that's wealth. <laughs> so then she talks about getting money. She really loves to harp on the fact that she is generous with her money. That's really important to her to remind you. And at first I was on board because at first she's talking about little things like how she loves to tip big because she was a waitress for so long. And if she gets a bonus for a show, she passes it on to her opener and the people who did her hair and makeup. And like that is great practice. But then she's like, I've given most of my amazing best friends six figure checks to make their lives a little easier. I've donated the majority of my salary for the fourth season of my TV show to the crew, all of whom have worked on Inside Amy for anywhere between two to four years. Every dollar I made shooting the movie Thank You for Your Service went to families of PTSD victims. And I was just like, okay, now we're just like listing all the money she's ever given away. And it yeah, and I've heard from people who've worked with her that she is very generous about like buying super fancy meals for everybody and all that shit. But I also think 
at a certain point, she starts like shitting on other people for not doing that. She's like, I tipped a thousand dollars at this restaurant near Broadway when I was on my way to go see a musical. I can't believe this restaurant that rich people go to more people aren't tipping big. And it's just like, I mean, you're right. But you don't have to be like, listen, I'm the only one who did this. Here's my proof. (laughs) I did feel very self-congratulatory for chapter three. (laughs) We're page 36. And I've pointed this out a lot. People who get a lot of money love to tell you the smallest amount of money that was very important to them to relate themselves down to earth. She talks about getting her first check for $800 and being so excited about it. Once we go beyond her making $2,000 for a weekend of comedy shows, she never gives us a number again. Give us the numbers. We I wanna just know. want to know. Num- I'm curious. <laughs> she also says that she loves having money so she can do funny pranks. And she's like, my agent is my friend and he's a young guy who's incredibly shy and does not like attention called to him. A true introvert, I would call that. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think it's hilarious to humiliate him. So I have on several occasions hired a clown to show up at his office while he's in a meeting and make him balloon animals to sing to him. I hate that. I hate a prank. I don't like George Clooney's pranks. I don't like Amy Schumer's pranks. I don't like when people prank people. I don't think it's nice to humiliate people for fun. April Fool's Day is Claire's 9-11. <laughs> and then we have a chapter that is an example of beyond even open letter to my vagina, which was a whole lot of nothing. This is like a whole nothing of nothing. It's a nothing of nothing of this nothing. This is what I meant by her looking around being like, what can I write about next? She writes an introduction to my stuffed animals where she literally just describes her favorite stuffed animals. It's five pages. This woman is 35 years old at the time of writing. And also I kept thinking that it was going to go to some story, but it's truly not. It's an intro paragraph for just seven or eight stuffed animals. Yeah. And then we get to the first heartfelt chapter, dad. This is a chapter about her dad who suffers from multiple sclerosis. And she kind of illustrates it through times that he lost control of his bowels. When I was 14, my dad shit himself in an amusement park. Through these stories, she explains her relationship with her dad. My dad always made me feel super loved and did the best he possibly could. But when I was a kid, his identity confused me. He wasn't the golf playing, beer drinking family man I saw on TV or in my friend's kitchens. He wasn't so easily labeled. When he was younger, he'd been a wealthy bachelor living in 1970s New York City when it was also in its prime. He'd shared a penthouse with his best friend, Josh, who was a well-known actor at the time. He did drugs and slept with girls and enjoyed every moment of his life. When he met my mom, he said goodbye to that lifestyle, kind of. Throughout my childhood, he was always in shape, tanned and well-dressed. He was an international businessman, frequently traveling to France, Italy, and Prague. He always smelled like European cologne, cigarettes, and something else I couldn't yet recognize but later discovered was alcohol. And then she says, I never knew my dad to be a big drinker. I only later found out that my dad was as serious an alcoholic as they came. He needed to go to detox several times when we were children. The only thing that slowed down his drinking was multiple sclerosis. He was diagnosed when I was about 10. And so she does kind of talk about how this diagnosis has always just been a part of their life. And when you are a child like that and you're not really able to conceptualize mortality, his sickness was just part of their existence, but not something she really understood. Yeah, but I also don't think that that necessarily has to do with being able to like cognitively understand the sickness. I think that this is a really interesting chapter about these types of chronic illnesses where it is a part of your life, but it can't define your life. It's something you have to live alongside. But I think that a lot of times when people who haven't dealt with anything similar, the way we kind of hear about it in like popular media is Mm -hmm. like life kind of stops at diagnosis, kind of like before diagnosis and after diagnosis, that is not the center of your world. And I kind of think it doesn't have to be the way she's writing about this. Yes, he gets diagnosed and then he gets married three more times. And like, you know what I mean? His life continues and his disease does progress, but he isn't a guy with MS. He's her dad who also is progressing with MS. Yes. So she says, I've realized now how funny my dad was. And she gives these examples like once my grandma was talking to him and said, if I die, and he corrected her slyly, when? He was even dark with us as children. That's not the funniest joke I've ever heard. That's barely a joke at all. I don't know. (laughs) She really loves him. She also talks about how sometimes he's funny and sometimes he just says really mean things. Yeah, later she's like, sometimes they're just out and out insults. But she talks about how much she loves him and... That's kind of their story. So she talks about her parents got divorced right around when she was 14, 13, 14. And she fully blames her mom. She never morally qualifies what the impact of his alcoholism and constant cheating would have done to her mom or like their lives or his business. It's only this just is a fact. He was also an alcoholic at the time and he was constantly going through detoxes. You know, he sort of gave up the bachelor life, kind of like there's never a second 
sentence about what that might mean for all the people around him. But meanwhile, when we get to the chapter about her mom, but then she spends the rest of the book doing these little digs at her mom. It's very bizarre. You don't often see it as an adult. No, it's pretty interesting. So then this next chapter is honestly quite dark. This next chapter is an excerpt from her journal in 1994, age 13, with footnotes from 2016. I personally hate a footnotes chapter. But it's so hard to read when you're just bouncing back and forth. That's not how the eye reads. And she'll do dozens of them per page on these diary entries. And it's like, that is a very hard way to read what should be a short chapter. <laughs> Here is the diary chapter. I've decided to get a journal because there are some things I can't say out loud. I'm 13 years old and I have several problems. My brother Jason is a senior in high school. He's my half brother, meaning we have the same mother, but his dad died when he was 11. When Jason was two years old, our mom married my dad. My dad didn't like my brother. And as a matter of fact, he wished Jason wasn't a part of our family. I never noticed, but my dad actually never went on our family trips. My mom just recently pointed all of this out to me. She says she tried to keep everybody happy by having dad go in one car and me and my brother and sister go in the other car with her. Jason's dad was a very big part of his life. My mom informed me that when he died, my dad made no effort to become Jason's stepfather. They seemed to be acquaintances. This left my mom a single parent, basically with no help from my father. I'm so glad she pointed this out to me because I never knew. She allowed Jason to withdraw from our family, which is no longer a family. That's the original journal entry. And the footnotes are all about how, yikes, was that true? There was a lot of heavy brainwashing going on from good old mom in this entry. I don't think my dad particularly cared for my brother, but it wasn't personal. He just only liked children that at one point shot out from his own penis. That's like a crazy thing to think isn't that bad she basically is footnoting this whole thing with about like can't you see how evil my mom was my mom was brainwashing 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 and I do agree like obviously it's not great in a divorce no matter how hard you've been to try to turn your children against the other parent but also it is crazy for her as an adult to be like my dad had every right to not love the child in his home <laughs> so her parents got married when Jason was three or four yeah because all of the siblings are four years apart so Jason's only four years older than her at this point, when Amy is 13 years old, that means this dad has known Jason for at least 13 years and is still deeply indifferent towards him. That is like a shitty way to treat a child in your home. Yeah. I do see both sides. I see how it was very manipulative of her mom to be like, well, this is why your dad do it. But also to, as an adult, be like, and as was his right, to say it's not personal is like, okay, explain that to a 12-year-old whose dad just died and the man in his house doesn't like him very much. When they got a divorce, she goes, what? But mom kept us all happy by driving us in separate cars. As if the problem was that her mom would try to keep them happy by keeping them separate, as opposed to the problem being like... The dad for hating his stepson. Yeah. Yeah, the problem was definitely the mom here. She also talks in this diary chapter about her best friend, Mark, who is currently the drummer in the band Taking Back Sunday. And that is a wild... Uh, Wild connect. Also, I think Death Cat for Cutie, I think those guys grew up best friends. There's like those back and forth songs because they hooked up with the same girl. So I guess at one point, Amy Schumer, Taking Back Sunday and Death Cat for Cutie were all what in the same town. What is there about Amy? It's Just not. Just kidding. They're not. Because she, doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't hook up. So then there's a chapter called Officially a Woman, which is about her bat mitzvah. It's about the first time she ever made people laugh. And she's like, that's when I became a woman. Sure. Anyway, so then she talks about Camp Anchor, which is a camp she volunteered at because she wanted to hook up with a guy who was also volunteering there. And it was a camp for people with special needs. And she had hoped she would go in and be teamed up with her crush and work with the little kids. And what happens is she actually gets put in charge of the group that's 35 plus. So fully adults. Mostly like with Down syndrome. Yeah. She says one of the women has schizophrenia. I mean, just adult women, which I actually think is very inappropriate of the camp. And I do think it was fair for a 14 year old Amy to be like, this is not appropriate or what yeah, I signed up for. Yeah, to have for. a 14-year-old in charge of adults. I think that that's disrespectful. Me too. Anyway, but now Amy, as an adult woman, is using these women as punchlines. So the whole chapter is just funny situations that occurred, but the punchline of all these jokes is just situations that happen because these adult women have, like, cognitive disabilities, and I just, like, don't think that that's a good punchline. At the end, she, like, learns a lesson from them, and you're just like, great, I'm glad that they were there to teach you something about yourself. And it is three or four stories. Like one of them is an adult woman. She's like in her 60s, puts her bathing suit on backwards. So Amy has to go and help her put her bathing suit on the right way. And I get that you go home and you're just like, ah, this is what I had to do today. And it's whatever in your living room. But I think to, in a book, be using these situations for laughs is inappropriate. I completely agree. And exploitive. I think it's very exploitive. Don't volunteer if you think the work is so ridiculous. Like, this is what you signed up to do. It is what she literally signed up to do, and it didn't go exactly the way she planned, but... But again, I think this is why you don't have a 14-year-old do it. <laughs> yeah, because they, like, don't have the emotional maturity to, like, respect the situation at all. 
So then she gets into a chapter called How I Lost My Virginity, which I actually liked. I do think she has a couple topics in this book that, to me, she touched on well. I think that this is one of the things that she really wanted to write about. And I do think she writes about it in... It's called How I Lost My Virginity. And she says, I always fantasized about losing my virginity the way I think most girls envisioned their wedding. Being surrounded by friends, family, and clergymen present. JK, JK. <laughs> she says JK a lot in this book. Oh, yeah. There's one part where she goes JK, 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 but kind of not K. I do think... As a comedian, you should be able to convey jokes and not jokes without having to, like, delineate this was the joke. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can. Sometimes you're JKing and sometimes you're not K. <laughs> but so she talks about how growing up, she actually had a very open line of communication with her mom about sex, which I would say is a good thing. She says, whenever I'd have a question, my mom and I would go to Bigelow's clam chowder and I'd ask away, all while downing a bowl of New England clam chowder. I'd make her laugh, slurping the soup up and asking obscene questions. In retrospect, obviously none of this was okay or appropriate. Why? I guess I don't, I disagree. I think it's great to have an open line of communication with your kid. I think kids should have somebody they feel safe, an adult who loves them, that won't shame them for being sexually curious. Uh, maybe it's like inappropriate to be eating clam chowder. Why? Because people have mean things to say about vaginas. Like that's your own misogyny. I'm sure they didn't exclusively go there to talk about sex. I'm sure that was like their special place. That was a sex restaurant. <laughs> Her mom would be like, taste that clam chowder. What's that remind you of? Any questions? <laughs> So one of the questions she asks her mom is, she says, I think I'm ready and I want to have sex with Mike. Looking back, I realized that going to your mother for a pep talk about losing your virginity in high school is odd, but I was raised with no boundaries. I actually think that that's a good person to speak to, and I don't think, I think it's good that she made you feel like it was okay. Yeah, I don't think you're going for a pep talk. I think that if you want to open up to your parent about the possibility of losing your virginity, like that's a positive. I feel like it's good to raise a child who feels comfortable having open and honest conversations with you. Her mom says you shouldn't do it because how would you feel if he made out with somebody the next weekend because they weren't dating. It was just like a guy she liked. I thought about it and she was right. I wasn't a hard and groupie following my favorite band on the road. I was a teenager. So I listened to my mom and held on to my hymen for another year. So like I actually don't know what she thinks is wrong with that conversation. Just like very good advice. <laughs> the next year I started dating a guy named Jeff. He was a classically handsome, popular guy, but there was something different about him too. He was angrier than most teenage boys and a little misunderstood. Angrier than most teenage boys. That's very angry. She felt like she was the only one who understood him, and we had somehow gotten to the habit of watching Monday Night Raw with 40s of beard that we had snuck into my bedroom. And she said that they would, like, hook up and make out, but she wanted to take it slow. She wanted to, like, round each base. He seemed very sexually ashamed, and she taught him how to jerk off in front of her, so they would just mutually masturbate a lot. Yeah, he had, I think, she said a lot of, like, religious shit pent up, and then also... They were still young. Like, you don't have to be having sex. Like, she talks about how she wanted to really hit each base as its own milestone, which, like, good. So I think she's about 17 at this point. One night, as we lay on the bed with the lights off watching wrestling, I was zoning out. The combination of the time of the night, the content of the show, and the beer had me in and out of sleep. At one point, I was lying on my back, not paying attention, and suddenly felt Jeff fingering me. We hadn't been fooling around at all, so it seemed strange to go right to that. It started to hurt, which hadn't ever been the case before. So I looked down and realized that he had put his penis in me. He was not fingering me. He was penetrating me without asking first, without kissing me, without so much as looking in my eyes or even confirming if I was awake. When I startled and looked down, he immediately removed himself from me and yelled quickly, I thought you knew. This seemed very strange to me for him to protest so adamantly with such a prepared defensive line, even though I hadn't yet said a word. I looked down and saw some blood on my bed. I was confused and hurt. He left soon after and I rolled over and cried. So she writes about the next day he apologized. She says, I wanted to help him. I put my head on his chest and told him it was okay. I comforted him. Let me repeat, I comforted him. He'd made the decision without me. It wasn't about us. It was about him. I felt sad and betrayed. I thought he really cared about me, but this didn't feel like something that someone who cared about you would do, but I still wanted us to be okay. And the strangest part is that even though Jeff apologized and told me how bad it made him feel, I don't remember ever really taking him to task about how it made me feel. I did what most girls do and continued on. I think that that is just such a common situation. To not think about what happened to you and feel bad for them. The amount of arguments I've been in with boyfriends who are shitty. They did something to hurt me and then my being upset made them sad. And so then I had to make them feel better for making me sad. And it's just like... Well, a good thing to do would be to learn the lesson that you don't like making me feel bad and maybe try changing your behavior. Yeah, and sad is obviously like a glossing over term for, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not saying like, oh, this made her sad. Like she was assaulted. 
the fact that he was like, oh, I feel guilty, so make me feel better. It's like, well, what did you do that made you feel guilty? Is that wrong? She said, I didn't know it then, but I know now that it toughened me up in an irreversible way. For many years when it came to sex, I didn't get the luxury of being myself. Half the time I was too defensive and guarded, assuming a guy wanted to hurt me or take too much. The rest of the time I was too flippant, almost to the point of being dissociative, as if the act of sex didn't matter much to me. I'd tell myself I could have sex with any guy I wanted, even if I didn't care about him. Neither of these versions of me was real. I do feel like you see that in this book, that she still hasn't figured that out to this day. Like, I think the exact flipping back and forth that you were discussing, it comes from this trauma Mm -hmm. of she hasn't been able to rectify the two yet. Yeah, I agree. She talks about, I mean, rape as a statistic and how often it happens, how we demand perfect victims, and how a lot of times when a woman comes forward, people are very quick to assume she's lying. The facts of my situation are pretty clear to me still. He was inside of me in a way I hadn't consented to. I wish I had talked to a parent or adult at the time to sort out my feelings of confusion and betrayal. I wish I'd have stood up for myself more and told Jeff that what he did was wrong. But this happens so frequently that clearly we need to talk about it. Everyone should understand that there are no excuses for non-consensual sex. Virginity shouldn't be something you lose or give. Sex is something you share. He just helped himself to my virginity and I was never the same. Many girls remain silent about their experiences and that is their choice. I am opening up about my first time because I don't want it to happen to your daughter or sister or friend someday. I want to use my voice to tell people to make sure that they have consent before they have sex with someone. I hope all parents talk to their kids about consent and when you do, please, please don't make the mistake my mother made. Don't do it over a bowl of clam chowder because that is just gross and creepy. I just like understand her hatred for her mom is like so intense it's so weird i do think you can eat whatever food you want while you talk to your kid about sex i think the more important thing is that your kid feels safe and assured and understood like would you say you can't eat any penis shaped foods like don't ever do it over a popsicle or a hot dog or a sausage or an eggplant no because of the misogyny that anything related to like a female genitalia is inherently bad I think it honestly doesn't even have to do with the clam chowder. I think she just thinks her mom did a bad job because she doesn't like her mom. (laughs) She has like a lot of anger towards her mom that she didn't realize until she was like 28. But now the problem is she's gone back through her childhood and just assumes it was all bad and she doesn't know how to distinguish what is reasonable to be upset about and what she's just projecting. Yes. So then we get a fucking hold on to your neck, bitches. (laughs) We are about to get some whiplash throughout this book. Following the heavier hitting, intense, more in-depth chapters, she will just follow it up with the most frivolous shit you've ever heard. And there is no padding. There is no soft in-between. She doesn't even, she doesn't give you a crash pad. She doesn't even lay a towel down. There is no comfort in this transition. We just hit our heads right into things you don't know about me. And the opening one is like, I have a bad scar on my left leg from a surfing accident. I don't care. I understand the attempt to soften hard blows with comedy, but this is not how you do it because this is not actually taking a tough thing and then finding the humor in it. This is just completely 180-ing, and that's a cop-out. If you look at the difference between her book and Tiffany Haddish, who very successfully is emotional and vulnerable and tells these horrific stories that then she segues into being funny, it's because she finds the absurdity and the humor in the situation itself and allows this situation to speak for itself. And she takes you through this, the intensity of the emotion and then soft lands onto something still relevant, but funny. Yeah. In a way that's like, here's how I've concluded it in my own life. And here's how I deal with it in my head. And she takes you through a natural progression of emotion. This is just, here's something bad. Here's something random. And that's not good writing. That's not successful writing. That's just, changing the subject 100%. It's not even a sorbet. I don't know what this is. It doesn't cleanse the palate. It does like, I guess, wipe your brain because it's so nothing. You don't feel any of the previous moments because now you've been dealt nothing. I I wanna read one other thing you don't know about her, just like in case Amy's listening, because I do think this is important for her to discover about herself. One of the things you don't know about her is I'm not allergic to any foods, but eggplant hurts my mouth. Babe, you're allergic to eggplant. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that's important to know about yourself. Um, speaking of allergies, Jiminy's is a sustainably made and hypoallergenic dog food made from cricket protein. If you care about the environment and have a dog, consider reducing your dog's carbon paw print with Jiminy's sustainable dog food and treats. Cricket protein uses less water and land to produce and drastically eliminates greenhouse gas emissions versus traditional animal protein dog food. One bag of Jiminy's Cricket Protein Treats saves 220 gallons of water versus traditional animal protein treats. 
Dogs love the taste. She goes absolutely crazy for them. And cricket protein is considered hypoallergenic, which because of Bugs' sensitive tiny allergy belly, this is truly the only treat that I'm feeding her right now because everything else makes her eyes go goopy. It's easy to digest. Cricket protein contains a fiber that is prebiotic, so it supports a healthy gut. And like I said, it is great for the environment. Um, Bug is honestly huge into the environment. She's really big on doing her part in the community. She picks up trash by the side of the road every single day to help create a cleaner tomorrow. Check out Jiminy's Dog Food and Treats made with Cricket Protein, a sustainable superfood that is delicious, nutritious, and easy to digest for dogs. To learn more and save 25% on your first purchase, go to Jiminy's.com slash Worm25 and use the code Worm25 at checkout. That's J-I-M-I-N-Y-S dot com slash Worm25 with the code Worm25. And while you're outside taking in the quality time with your pup or with your friends, how about gathering around perhaps a solo stove? I just say my dad was like actually upset when we started advertising solo stove because apparently last year his single purchase of the year, he loves himself like a purchase of the year, was a solo stove because he went to his friend's house and they had one that he was so obsessed with that he went out and got one himself and he was so sad to miss out on the worm discount. (laughs) We're about to spend a weekend with a solo stove. We're doing a real solo stove themed weekend. I love hanging out around a fire. It gives a late night a purpose. I think if there's any way to turn any space into a hangout space, it's a fire pit. It makes your life feel like a movie. You're just like me and my friends down by the fire, having a, having a drink, looking at the stars. I'm in New York City. I don't even, are there stars still there? Right now, you can get big discounts on all fire pits during Solo Stove's 4th of July sale and use the promo code WORM at solostove.com for an extra $10 off. That's solostove.com promo code WORM for $10 off on top of their incredible 4th of July sale discounts. But hurry, the 4th of July sale ends July 10th. The next chapter is Can't Knock the Hustle. Yeah, she opens with, I've been a hustler my whole life. I know you're thinking, check yourself, Amy. You are not Jay-Z, which... You're literally not. The other thing is I do want to say, she uses hip hop artist as a punchline eight or nine times in this book. That's her like largest racist aggression in the book. It's very much her stand in for Nouveau Riche. And then one time she uses it as somebody who would steal semen. I'm not trying to like or retroactively cancel her from this book, but like... Before <laughs> I was like, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. And I do stand by that. I thought it would be pretty atrocious, but if... There was one thing to point. It was like noticeable how often she used hip hop artist as stand in for like tacky consumer. Okay. So then this is a chapter about shoplifting. She is one of the many young shoplifters that we've met. She's very proud of it. She got arrested a little bit, but still went to a concert that night. The long term consequences were none. I really am sick of white girls bragging about their shoplifting experience because they're always being like on the one hand don't do it this is a horrible thing for you to do don't do it but when I was doing it for fun because I was bored at 14 isn't that impressive it's like it's not really impressive and I don't really care and I don't think it's like a cute thing to brag about no and then she's like and now I have a new hustle making people laugh and it's like that's a literal different thing then she has a chapter called faked it till I Maked it about the time she became a waitress at a restaurant where she did the first round of interviews and they're like no you have no idea what you're talking about and then she just came back the next day anyway truly Almost everyone has a fake it till I made it story. Everyone loves to be like, here's a crazy tip that you might have never, ever, 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 ever thought of. Act like you belong there and then you will. Here is my theory, though, about faking it till you make it. Almost all successful people have a chapter about faking it till they make it because that is the skill most necessary in being successful. Yeah. (laughs) They're always like, I wasn't qualified to do something, but I did it anyway because I was confident and the people who have self-doubt are the ones who are getting good because they're so they have so much self-doubt that they feel like they need to be good at it first before they apply and that and that'll hold you back because you'll never be good enough like there's always more skills there's always someone to beat there's always another level that you think you have to pass before you're ready to like apply for a certain thing like we know people who are creative who will just spend years in their room honing something before they put it out there. And then the person who just like puts it out there and looks like a dumbass for three years will beat them because they've been out there. Then she's a chapter beautiful and strong. I liked this chapter. She says, right before I left for college, I was running my high school. I knew where to park, where to get the best chicken cutlet sandwich and which custodians had pot. People knew me. They liked me. I was an athlete and a good friend and I felt pretty. I felt seen. I had an identity. Then I got to college where the class of freshman girls at my school, Towson University of Maryland, had just been voted Playboy Magazine's number one hottest in the nation and not because of me. And so then she tells this story about feeling very lost and like nobody cared about her or knew her. And the story she specifically shares is she had a crush on some super senior. 
And one morning at 8 a.m., he calls her up and is like, hey, do you want to come over? And she, like, delusionally is like, oh, my God, we're going to go on a day-long date where, like, we have picnics and breakfasts and stuff. And she, like, shaves her legs and runs right over. And then, of course, as soon as she gets there, she realizes he's drunk from the night before. And she's like, oh, I wasn't the first person he thought of in the morning. I was the last person he thought of last night. So they hook up. And she has this realization of, like, I'm not going to let someone do that to me again. Most of the time these days, I feel beautiful and strong. I walk proudly down the streets of Manhattan, the same girl I was during my senior year of high school. The people I love love me. I'm a great sister and friend. I make the funniest people in the country laugh. So much has changed about me since I was that confident, happy girl in high school. In the years since then, I've experienced a lot of desperation and self-doubt. But in a way, I've come full circle. I know my worth. I embrace my power. I say if I'm beautiful. I say if I'm strong. You will not determine my story. I will. I'll speak and share and fucking love, and I will never apologize for it. And I'm amazing for you, not because of you. I'm not who I sleep with. I am not my weight. I'm not my mother. I am myself, and I am all of you. <laughs> Another little jab at mom. The jab at the mom aside... <laughs> <laughs> I actually really liked this chapter and I know that Amy Schumer is problematic in a lot of ways and I know that as a white woman the scrutiny of her body does not help what black women go through in the media and stuff but I was thinking a lot about how when I was a teenager a very common and public discussion was does Amy Schumer have the right to be on TV because a lot of people don't think she's hot and you can say whatever like oh the truth is she does not fit the white standard of beauty she just doesn't she doesn't have the body that we've been told you need to have to be seen to be alive and have that be like a public discourse about whether or not Amy Schumer is hot enough to be allowed to have a TV show or exist or say anything I feel like the ways that that just seeps into your subconscious and it yeah. affects the way you see yourself and the way you see other women even just reading that paragraph at the end about how she has chosen it doesn't matter what other people say. She has chosen to give herself permission. She loves herself. She is happy with herself. It did impact me a bit. It did like jolt me awake to realizing how insidious and ridiculous that conversation was in the first place and how much of it affects me every day. And I appreciated that. And I understand that like this might not help everybody, but I well, personally I did too, like that. I think that there is now a lot more affirming information for like not the exact specific standard of beauty that we had in like 2003. But I also think that that... And also that was more about than just being beautiful. Yeah. Being like... Worthy. I, I can make the funniest people in the world laugh. I love the people who love me. And I'm a good friend. And I'm a good sister. And I'm a good person. And I'm allowed to exist. I mean, I had that comment about me last week that said that I like wasn't pretty enough to be talking about the things that I talk about. And like the part that made me maddest about that comment wasn't even that the person was calling me not pretty. If you aren't attracted to me, that is up to you entirely. Like I honestly... I'm not that bothered by it, but to say that because I'm not attractive to you, my opinions don't matter. Sure. Like I shouldn't be allowed to speak into a microphone ever because I'm not pretty to you. That's insane. Yeah. And that like really upset me. <laughs> anyway, so then we get to the part. How to become a stand-up comedian. Amy Schumer does have a very interesting path. She has a very unique path. The only other two comedians I can think of that have had a similar trajectory to her are Michael Che and Eliza Schlesinger. A lot of people will do open mic comedy, which is comedy where it's at a bar or a restaurant or a club and you just go there, you sign up. Sometimes you pay five dollars, you get like three to five minutes to do whatever you want. And then the next person goes up. That's an open mic. Anyone can sign up. It's just you put your name on a list and mostly it's only comedians in the audience. And a lot of people will do open mics for a couple of years. As you do more open mics, you start getting booked on shows, which are showcases that have like only five or so comedians that get chosen in advance to do 10 minutes on that show. And then as you have more shows, you start doing less open mics. You sort of slowly graduate out of open mics and then eventually, hopefully you get a TV show or something you get picked up by a headliner who brings you on the road with them to feature and then you start getting more stage time that way or you get an agent in representation and, and they help you get things that earn you money anyway for amy schumer what happened is she started doing bringer shows which is a different kind of show at a club where you sign up but in order to get your stage time you have to bring like four friends or family they buy a ticket that's usually like 15 to $30. And then they also have a two drink minimum. So then the club makes like 50 bucks a head. But that's what Amy Schumer got her start doing. She did a lot of them. And I have to say, and most a lot of people do. I don't, personally don't know that many people who did as many bringers as she did. True. It is so expensive. And it, I mean, you just burn bridges every time. Like, I don't know that I personally have any friends who would be willing to spend 50 to $70 a pop every time I did stand up. I don't think I have a single one. 
It's a big ask, especially when you're doing bad stand-up comedy. So it's like your second time ever on stage. Like you're not good at it. No one on there is good at it. Okay, so she was doing bringer shows. She says she was doing one every week, every other week for a couple of months, which I do think is a very extended amount of time because at these you would be meeting other comedians who would be telling you about open mics, which are free ways to do comedy. Or at the very least, only $5. So she does these for a few months. She slowly starts to integrate open mics into them. She says she got really addicted and was doing them all the time, getting booked on more shows. And two and a half years in, she was recommended for this thing called Just for Laughs, which is a Montreal comedy festival that has a showcase called New Faces, which is essentially the draft for comedy where agents and club owners and people from all across the country send in who they think is like up next to be a breakout star. And so they all submit these people who presumably aren't repped or are repped but aren't getting anything. And they have this showcase where it's like 16 repped, 16 unrepped people that do stand up in a room full of TV execs and other agents and like bigger industry names. It's a huge deal in the comedy world. It doesn't matter to literally anybody else. But in the comedy world, it is like the thing to get. It's like getting valedictorian or something. Yes. So she got it two and a half years in, which is extremely early. A lot of people get it six to eight to ten years in, I'd say. Yeah, I would say like seven to ten feels like standard. Yeah, so she got it way ahead of schedule. And then on top of that, from this, I think, she got an audition for Last Comic Standing, which is American Idol for stand-up comedy. And she went, she auditioned. She didn't think she would even get it, she says in this book. But she got passed to the first round, which means she flew out to L.A. And she says people were so mean to her. She felt that because it was a reality TV show, that she was cast more as a character than a comedian. That she was cast because they needed, like, a young gun in there. And she was, like, blonde and 24 or whatever. I guess at this point she would have been 26. So she was relatively young. And she was up against all these, like, road dogs. So people that have been doing it 20, 30 years. But she says because of that, she thinks she was able to do so much better than everybody else because people who are doing 90 minutes of comedy have to tell longer stories. They have to have their set down pat. 60 to 90 minutes of just joke, 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 joke gets very grating and isn't actually fun to listen to. It has to be like drawn out stories with punchlines in order for it to be like engaging for long periods of time. So in New York City, you do the showcase style where you're only getting 10 minutes. So your jokes tend to only be one minute. You know what I mean? In three minutes, you can get five or six jokes across, which not only means she was more like flexible for the short amounts of time they were given for auditions, but also they were better cut up into sound bites for TV. I also do think that there's like hugely something to not thinking that you should even be there because these road dogs are kind of like, this is my opportunity to really develop an audience. This is my moment that I've been fucking Mm -hmm. waiting for. Whereas for her, she's like, this is a cool thing to be doing this early in. If this bombs, I'm sure something else will come along. You know what I mean? This is not her last dying grasp at success. (laughs) It's her first grasp. I also think you know a lot of people hate on Amy Schumer and they're like she's not even funny blah 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 clearly she is clearly she is clearly like she's the only female comic to have ever sold out Madison Square Garden from this book you wouldn't think so but she is the truth of comedy that I think a lot of comics specifically New York City comics can lose is they get really into the weeds on like the most genius unique unseen joke like a thought that's never been thought before but you're just trying to make people laugh if you're making people laugh then you're doing your job and if you're not making people laugh then you're not doing your job and if people say that was like a really interesting point when you get off stage you bombed she had been a performer her whole life she'd always been in plays she was in acting school there is something too if you go out there with charisma and can control the energy of the room and make people laugh then you are the funniest person in the room I mean she wasn't getting these things out of nowhere there was something about her and she had an x factor and I'm I'm kind of tired of denying people that being said this one line is really funny to me when she's talking about her work ethic a comic Pete Dominic who I met doing a bringer at Gotham pushed me hard to get better he said you need to know the name of every club in New York and you need to get up wherever you can it has to be an obsession it does have to be an obsession but every comic in New York is obsessed with it and like the The distinction being knowing the name of every club. I don't know that that's... Everybody I know in New York City who's like seriously trying to be a comic is getting up on stage two to three times a night without fail. Yeah, and can name... I just don't see how like that's even a hard mountain to climb. There's like eight comedy clubs in New York. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not saying Amy Schumer didn't work hard, but I do think that to be like, I was working so hard, I was doing comedy... Once a day. From the inside, we can tell you a lot of people are doing that. Yeah. And clearly, something set Amy apart. So I'm not saying she doesn't deserve anything. I'm not saying she's not good. I'm just saying that's not a work ethic that shocks me. 
But so then she talks about how she came in fourth on Last Comic Standing, and because of that, she was allowed to do the headlining tour for Last Comic Standing for a year. All of the comedians who were top five would go on this tour. And she does say, which I respect, I bombed 40 of the 50 cities because she said I'd only had 15 minutes of material because I hadn't been doing it that long, which sounds exactly right. And that might sound crazy, two and a half years. But after two and a half years, you have 15 minutes of good jokes. That's And then after on. five years, you have four minutes of good jokes. And then after 10 years, you have 20 minutes of good jokes. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about stand-up is... And we can attest, you get 10 to 12 minutes on stage where people are there for the hype. And then after that, if you don't have good jokes, the audience knows. And I think not to be rude, but a good example is Alana Glazer. Yeah, I've definitely seen her get up and the crowd is so happy the first five minutes of her set because they're like, that's my favorite person from my favorite TV show. And then in about minute 10, they're like, oh, maybe you're not funny. (laughs) Yeah, or maybe not even that you're not funny, but, like, you did not come here with jokes for us. So she says she was bombing because she just couldn't fill the time. So after headlining for a year, she comes back and goes back to featuring. And then obviously works her way back up to a headliner, and then she gets a TV show, and then she gets movies, and now she's a very famous lady. So on the Patreon this week, we're going to be reviewing the JLo doc, but also we're going to talk about how to start a podcast. A lot of people have asked us. So we're going to go through, like, all the technical things you need and, like, the literally step-by-step how to upload an RSS feed, how to, like, get a Buzzsprout account or what the options are. And then our tips. Our personal tips for what's worked for us. But also, if you guys are interested, we could do a stand-up one if you want to know how to get involved in stand-up. Oh, yeah. So let us know. We could do that. Truly, anyone can do it. (laughs) (laughs) So then she gets into the worst end of my life. Here we go. It's time to tell you about Dan. I thought he was the love of my life for a long time, but I allowed him to hurt me in ways that I still don't understand. And she gets into an abusive relationship she was in. And I really like this chapter. Again, I think this is another one of the chapters that she does well. And there is something to get from here. So she says, Dan was fascinating to me. He grew up in Manhattan in an incredible loft and got shipped off to boarding school at 13. They had a very uneven power dynamic where she really liked him and he didn't like her. And it seems like... It feels like one of those things where she let go of a lot of things because she felt that she was getting something in return, which is him to agree to date her. Yeah, he, she felt like he was out of her league. So she felt he had the right to do things to her that were cruel. And she says, on a regular basis, Dan would say things to me that I didn't let anyone else say. Passively hurtful things to let me know that I wasn't as pretty as the other women he had dated. He'd point out areas of my legs and arms and stomach he thought I needed to work on. He'd pull the shower curtain open and laugh at my naked body. Once he even pissed on my legs and feet while laughing. And then she goes into Dan and I would go to happy hours with friends and get drunk and then he'd get mad at me and shove me a little. Sometimes from the shove, I'd trip over something and fall and get hurt. But of course, it was an accident. I got hurt by accident a lot that year. And I think that this, when it becomes physical, is something that a lot of people, like me included, have had a hard time with where like you allow yourself to think one tiny thing is just a mistake, a one-time thing, not a big deal. And then... When it escalates from there, you're like, well, I already let that. This is just like a half step up from that, and this is no different. So, like, it's not an abusive relationship. It just, like, was a thing. And then as it escalates, because you've, like, mind-tricked yourself into... Yeah, you feel trapped. Like, once it's past a point, you feel like you're not allowed to say anything anymore because you had already let so much slide that now you're like, well, it's my fault for creating an environment where this is acceptable. Yeah. And then another thing is she goes... Somewhere in the course of the relationship, I started to confuse his anger and aggression for passion and love. I actually started to think that real love was supposed to look like that. The more you yelled at each other, the more you loved each other. The more physical and demeaning it got, the more you were really getting through to each other. And the more I was willing to stand by him, the more he'd understand I truly loved him and that we should be together forever. And he always felt so bad after what he had done, after he shouted or bruised me. Surely he wouldn't beat himself up so much if he didn't love me. And so then we have going back to her first relationship the like comforting of the person who hurt you. So things keep escalating, including their relationship and including the abuse that's happening in it. And at one point she has moved out West Coast with him to live with him. I think they're in San Francisco for the summer. And they're out dancing with friends and he gets really angry that she's dancing and getting male attention. And so he grabs her off the bar and says, you're disgusting. I was furious. I thought I'll show you disgusting and began to dance very sexually with another guy on the floor. When Dan came out of the bathroom, he again dragged me to the booth. And that was when I did something that I'd never done before and never, ever will do again. I spit right in his face. And this maneuver awakened the beast in Dan and fired off my fear signal in one instant. He got a look in his eyes that scared the shit out of me, and I ran. I ran right out the door of the bar, and I kept running. So she runs and runs, and she's running away from him, and he's chasing her. And she's knocking on every door on the street to try to find someone that will let her in. And finally, she finds an open door, and she goes in, and it's like a gang doing drug deals. And so then she asked to call the police and they were like, could you 
not <laughs> the police aren't great for us right now and so she's like okay let me just call a friend and they're like okay fine and dan is outside screaming and so finally they're like he needs to shut up because he's drawing attention to us and so they go out and start arguing with him and it it ends in a fist fight where one of the guys is beating up Dan. As the guy started pounding Dan with his fist, I instantly switched teams and began to defend Dan. When you are an abuse victim, your logic and instinct be can become warped like this. Get off him, I yelled, running towards Dan, who was taking a serious beating. The gang members kicked us both off their property. And so then they walked the car in silence, and Dan seemed like he had calmed down. And I guess she's like, I want to go home. I can't go home with you tonight. I have to go to a different place. And he erupts again and he starts banging his head against the car he takes her hand and starts punching himself and she freaks out and doesn't know what to do and so they finally end up back at his apartment and she's trying to go to sleep and hoping it'll all just calm down and he goes outside and breaks a mug over his own head and when she goes outside to like comfort him and try to calm things down he grabs a butcher knife it may sound cliche but i saw my life flash before my eyes i thought this is how i die i can't believe it i thought about my sister and my mom finding out that this was how i checked out this thought awoke the beast in me. This was my moment of clarity. I had to get away from him fast. So she runs out and is able to find refuge in like a neighbor's apartment. She calls a friend to come get her and she goes to her friend's house that night and sleeps there and her friend's boyfriend sleeps by the door and that's when she realizes they have to break up. So the very next day she just flies back to New York and gets out of there. I flew back to New York the next day still worried about Dan and how he might be feeling. I knew he'd feel awful and lonely and would be in a lot of pain but I was choosing to live. I thought a lot about my sister and how I wanted to be the kind of person who would made her proud. I couldn't face her if I stayed another day with a man I believed would eventually kill me. And then she says, the next chapter in this story, and something that it pains me to tell you, is that we got back together one more time after that. It wasn't for very long, but the loneliness of New York City and my feelings for him weakened me. And I wanted to punish him for hurting me so much in the past. I thought I could do more damage from the inside. I was his girlfriend, which meant I had free reign to criticize him and point out why he was the worst. I'm not proud of that, but there was a part of me that wanted to be with him again so I could hurt him back. So then they finally do break up for the final time, and she says, when you're in love with a man who hurts you, it's a special kind of hell, yet one that so many women have experienced. You're not alone if it's happening to you, and you're not exempt if it hasn't happened to you yet. I found my way out, and we'll never be back there again. I got out. Get out. She says, she's like, I'm telling the story because I'm a strong-ass woman, not someone most people think of when they think abused women. I a lot like sexual assault. There's like a ton of misconceptions about who gets abused, like what abuse looks like. And I think every time someone's able to share their story, it helps. Then... Like a screeching fucking bumper car. We just get to a listicle. Things I hate. The Big Bang Theory. Radio Celebrity commercials. Celebrity DJs and bad boy chefs. People who go to Starbucks to write. Yuck. So then we get to the chapter about her mom, which is another th heavy one. So she talks about how she and her mom were extremely close growing up. Her mom was her best friend. And unfortunately... She was her mom's best friend, too, which I agree is an unhealthy dynamic. She says, do you think your mother always has the answer to everything, including great suggestions about your hair, clothing, and relationships? I recommend you examine your view of her. I want to be patient and let you discover it in your own time. That's a lie. Actually, I just want to pull the entire rug out from under you and rush you to see the light. Everyone's parents have fucked them up one way and the other. I don't... These things that she's still reckoning with, she shouldn't be writing about because she doesn't know how to do it with any sort of openness or grace. To be like, I'm mad at my mom right now, so your mom sucks too, feels like an unhelpful statement. <laughs> and so she spent a lot of her life on her mom's side when she was, what, like 13 or 14 years old? Yeah. Her mom left her dad for Amy's best friend's dad, and he was married too. So she, they used to go on vacations with this family, and then one day Amy comes home, her mom's crying on the couch, and tells her, I'm leaving your father for Mia's dad, Lou. And Amy's like, cool, I can tell you weren't happy. You should be happy. I want you to be in love. <laughs> I was not shocked that she was leaving my dad. I wasn't even under the impression that she was too fond of him. I had never seen them hold hands or kiss, and she'd always expressed an air of vague annoyance toward him. Even though my dad was funny and handsome, it was hard for me to believe that my perfect mother had stayed with my imperfect father for so long. I thought of her as Mother Teresa for staying with a man who never deserved her. Looking back now, I, of course, realized how unhealthy it was as a teen. I had such a strong sense of alignment with one parent against the other. My father was no angel. He drank in secret, and I know he did dirtbag things behind my mom's back. In their earlier days, I'm pretty sure she once walked in on him getting head from a hooker, but he never pretended to be perfect. So that ultimately is what she's the most mad at mo her mom about, always having a positive attitude and always acting like things were okay when they weren't. Yeah, so I guess the next day after this bombshell drops, she goes downstairs. Her mom is just making breakfast business as usual, and she's like, where's dad? Her mom's like moving his things out of my bedroom. 
business as usual. <laughs> and Amy is like furious that this was treated as if like if we act like nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. Hearing her say this made me believe that it was actually possible. I thought I learned everything I know from this adult and I trust her completely. If she's acting like this is all OK, then sure. There's nothing complicated about remaining best friends with Mia when her parents are having an affair. Nope, nothing at all. In retrospect, I wish my mother had been visibly affected by what was going on. How could she get up so early and smile so brightly? But that was always her MO, to decide on a new reality that made sense to her in the moment and force us to live in it with her. I know there's a lot that she hid from me and plenty that I don't know about what happened with her and Lou, but I wish she'd consider the ripple effects of her actions and then fought her desire to have this affair. At the very least, I wish she would have just been honest that she was weak and lost, that she pursued Lou because of the bad place she was in. I can't speak for her, but I don't believe she tried hard enough to think about everyone who would be affected by the relationship. Even worse, she got me on board. She made me my favorite breakfast and recruited me to be the cheerleader of her mistake. There was no, how are you feeling today, AIM? This must be a lot for you to deal with. So I acted like there wasn't. In the meantime, the stress and agony was suddenly bubbling to the surface and no, had had nowhere to go. So it was promptly internalized. I see it 100%. Like, obviously, it's hard for your parents to get divorced. It's harder when it's your mom is having an affair and leaving your dad for, like, your best friend. That's a hard situation but it, it's just interesting to me the way that her mom's actions she's like why didn't my mom consider the consequences of her actions we meanwhile her dad cheating on her mom with a sex worker is literally a parenthetical and her dad being an alcoholic is just sprinkled throughout as like fact of the matter was he drank a lot mia's family the dad who the mom had an affair with they went to the same synagogue as well and she goes we stopped going to temple where i had had my bat mitzvah it was too uncomfortable to show our faces there after my mom had wrecked a home in the community the mom was married too lou also wrecked a home in the community the home was mutually destroyed the contemporary perspective of adult amy writing about this is fully that this was her mom's fault and that she went out and destroyed things like for no reason she just one day woke up and decided to ruin everybody's lives without any idea of what the consequences would be and there doesn't seem to be any sympathy for, wow, what had she been enduring for like a decade that she just could not take anymore? As the mother of three, one child of which the father does not claim. So she has a husband who's drinking a lot, cheating on her, now diagnosed with a very serious illness that's going to require a lot of care. And and I, she's probably looking at her life being like, what do I do? <laughs> she cheats. I don't know. I'm not saying it's like reasonable. I'm not saying it's like the right choice, but I'm saying to, that she's like this evil monster from hell and no one else did anything wrong is... I don't, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there, but that doesn't seem true. So she talks about how all through her 20s, like she just adored her mom. She thought she had no flaws. She was always her mom's cheerleader. I used to bring her to comedy clubs with me and we were very much a part of each other's daily lives. We were enmeshed with not a single healthy boundary between us. And I was always defending the questionable choices she made in relationships. We have a different journey than most mothers and daughters. Maybe it helped my mom cope with life and manage and guard her, our relationship so closely. She couldn't control or deal with reality, but she can control me. Now in our 30s, my siblings and I have begun to become more vocal with each other about the hardships of growing up with our mom. We've each had our own specific struggles, but they're rooted in the experiences we shared of being emotionally suppressed or manipulated by her. As it turns out, being okay all the time as a child makes for a very difficult entry into adulthood. When I was about to turn 30, I was beginning to think about writing this book. I went back through the journals I've kept from the age of 13 and started reading what I'd written about Mia and Lou. As an adult reading the words of a child who was telling this awful story, I was able for the first time to separate my mother's actions from my adoration of her. It became very clear that she manipulated me in an unhealthy ways and that the remnants of that manipulation were still a part of our present day relationship. Yikes. So they get into a huge fight because her mom suggests that for Amy's 30th birthday, they go on a helicopter ride around Manhattan and then get hibachi and massages. I was suddenly floored with anger. I told her, I don't want to go on a millionaire matchmaker date with you for your, my birthday. This is not okay. Those are all the things she wanted to do on her birthday. <laughs> I understand what it's like when I understand what when you have one breaking moment like that that was her realization and I understand that like maybe looking back she finally allowed herself to feel things and they come through overwhelming and a change needed to take shape and she had anger that she had never really acknowledged before and it was coming out now but there is something so funny about being like that's not how I want to spend my 30th birthday <laughs> So at the age of 29, I began to forge a new relationship with her, one with Fort Knox level boundaries. Redirecting a relationship between two people who have been abnormally close for 30 years is not an easy thing to do. We had a period of my expressing my feelings about the past, followed by a period of us not speaking. I tried again and again to lay it out for her to explain my grievances and pain, and sometimes she did try to listen to where I was coming from. She stopped just defending herself and started to hear me, but ultimately I think it was too much for her to accept the gravity of what she had done and the effect it had on me and my siblings. We finally landed in a place where we have remained for several years. We are kind to one another, but I keep my boundaries clear. We speak regularly and keep each other up to date, but far less frequently. It's just crazy because she loves her dad so much. I know. 
I mean, this conclusion, she goes, when she tells me it will be okay, I believe her and go back to sleep. I love her. But make no mistake, if I knew I was going to eventually become her, if it were like World War Z and I had five seconds until I transitioned into fully being my mother, I would harakiri myself without a second thought. If you're a parent reading this, chances are you're not as tricky as my mom. I know she's a rare flower, but don't go patting yourself on the back too quickly. No matter what, you're still going to mess up your kids too, and they're going to hate you for a minute or two or three while they pick up the pieces of their childhood. Anyone who claims to skirt the system is just lying, and that's a far worse offense in my book. No matter what she put me through, I'm grateful to her, blah, blah, blah. I love her. I've never given up on her. I can't, and I never will. I do think to say, like, if I was my mom, I'd fucking kill myself. But I love her. Also, like, I've never given up on her. I don't understand what that, like, what is there to give up on? She's not a rookie basketball player (laughs) hoping to make it pro. I don't understand what you're talking about. There's just so obviously so much anger built up in her heart towards her mom, and she, like, does not know what to do with it. Well, speaking of planning and making sure you've got control of your life and your finances, Credit Karma is there to help you get a hold of old debt, upcoming expenses, the whole nine yards. Sometimes big expenses come from out of nowhere. Sometimes you have a big purchase coming down the line. You're super aware of it and you want to be in the best position possible to handle it with ease. A high interest credit card can be your absolute undoing, but Credit Karma can help you consolidate your finances into one loan with a lower interest rate and help you pay down debt or handle upcoming expenses much more successfully. Keeping track of multiple monthly payments, dates, debts, tons of different details and platforms and passwords can just be such a headache. So consolidating all of your debt into one place can be the smoothest, easiest way to get it paid down as quickly as possible. Credit Karma uses your credit data to find loan offers that are personalized to you so that you can have a better idea of what loan amount you can get approved for. It'll even show you your chances of approval so you can choose between loan offers that you're most likely to get approved for and apply with confidence. Ready to apply? Head to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to see personalized offers. Go to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to find the loan for you. That's creditkarma.com slash loan offers. And once you've got your finances nice and nourished, skip the meal prep stress and let Freshly handle lunch and dinner. Take advantage of their new limited time 4th of July sale to spend more time celebrating, less time stirring stuff. Freshly has delicious, fresh, and healthy meals that are designed by nutritionists and prepared by chefs to create the most delicious, never frozen, healthy, well rounded meals straight to your door with no cooking required. The Freshly website and app will help you find the meals that fit your lifestyle with plans that work for your dietary needs. There are over 50 nutritionist designed entrees like classic steak, peppercorn, multi serve sides like the masterful mac and cheese, or plant based meals. For me, that my favorite thing about Freshly is that they are ready so quickly. Sometimes I get home and I, like, obviously bug schedule comes first. So I get home from a long bug walk and I am simply ravenous. There is nothing I need more than a fresh meal ASAP. And instead of resorting to something unhealthy that just comes super quick, Freshly is a way to eat quickly and healthily. Stop stressing about dinner. Now through July 10th, Freshly is offering our listeners a special 4th of July deal, $150 off your first six orders when you go to Freshly.com slash worm. That's $150 off at Freshly.com slash worm through July 10th. Don't miss out on this 4th of July offer. Get $150 off at Freshly.com slash worm. So then she has a chapter. We're back about NYC apartments where Freshly would be very helpful because a lot of times they come with awful kitchens. But I'm not going to get into it because once again, we refuse to talk about your real estate shit. And then she has a chapter called Blackouts and Stem Cells, which feels very like she was trying to fit a square peg in a round hole situation. She talks about how she has a tendency for blackouts. In college, she blacked out drinking a lot. And stopped because it was getting dangerous and she didn't like it. But the last time she blacked out, she was an adult. And it was because... She had had like a very stressful day because her dad has MS and somebody had reached out to her to be like, there's this wonderful doctor in New York. She does a stem cell replacement treatment that could really help your dad. And so she talks about how her and her sister forced her dad to go. They wouldn't even tell him where they were going. Because he has a hard time accepting new information about his diagnosis. And the doctor does explain to Amy, you know, he's probably gotten his hopes up a lot of times and had them dashed a lot of times. So maybe it's hard for him to accept new treatments. And she's like, I never thought about that before. And then it's all about how much she loves her dad and feels so bad that she had been hard on him for trying to get him to stay alive. But luckily he was going to take the stem cells and isn't that heroic and it's so great. 
And, but then she was so stressed out that she smoked weed, took a Xanax, and then drank and, like, blacked out. And her boyfriend at the time, this was back when she was dating that hot furniture designer. Yeah, her Aiden. <laughs> yeah, he was like, you were eating chips with butter like it was guacamole. And she was like, pretty crazy, huh? And I was just like, these felt like two very disparate ideas. I don't know that they needed to be combined unless you're going to talk about how perhaps your history of blacking out in some way related to your dad's drinking problem. Then we get to a chapter called An Exciting Time for Women in Hollywood, where she just kind of harps on the term women in Hollywood and the way that women are asked questions in an extremely different way than men are, the way that a woman-led film is like a woman's comedy, where she's like, why aren't Ben Stiller's movies men's comedies like or like why if her movie fails are all women going to be set back for making their own movie whereas like when a boy comedy fails boys aren't told now you can't make movies and this the is same just shit like a we common, all know we hear it all the time and then she has a heartbreaking chapter about Macy and Jillian who are the women who were killed July 23rd 2015 at a train wreck screening by like just an evil man who she won't even name which I understand because she doesn't want to give him the notoriety, but she does say he had a history of domestic abuse. His family had come forward and said he needs help. He needs to be locked up. He's a danger to others and nobody had done anything. Things just kept getting ignored. And so then she calls for common sense gun laws, but in this way, that's very like, and I don't know. This is last of the heavy chapters and it's one that really kind of irked me because she like talks about how closely she holds these two women in her heart and how she's quite obviously someone who has a history of abuse, a history of violence, a history of saying, I want to get guns and kill people. How is this person able to buy a gun? And she's like, but I'm not saying no one should be able to get guns. That's not what I'm... She says several Don't times. get it twisted. I'm great friends with plenty of gun owners. I believe law-abiding Americans have every right to own a gun. But I think there's room for improvement, don't you? Having enough shootings happen... You know who says no? The people who profit the most from gun sales. But 92% of Americans, including 82% of gun owners, 74% of NRA members, support criminal background checks for all gun sales. But the gun lobby stops it. I guess I just think, and maybe it's because things just feel so dire right now, and I'm so fucking tired of having to say we should stop being able to kill people in a way that makes... Who? People Everybody who, happy. And she's like, says, just the idea that we have to worry about the feelings of somebody whose favorite activity on a weekend is to shoot an animal. Like, that's who I have to make sure I'm not offending. I'm tired I'm of not like. I'm a politician nor an NRA hating shifty Jew, as some people in certain parts of the. Why? I hate like, the NRA. I am. I'm an NRA hating shifty Jew. Like, I don't fucking give a fuck. I really genuinely believe in the from the bottom of my heart that if you think that in order to support your hobby, we have to put children in danger, like, no. Fucking give up a hobby. The amount that she panders to gun owners in this, I'm like, Jesus Christ. But she also does take the time to be like, because of all my work with gun reformation, I got to meet President Barack Obama, who told me he liked train wreck. And I'm like, well, cool. Things that make me happy is another Mm. dumb fucking list that's like not a joke at all. Then we have a chapter called The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow. And this is where she talks about meeting the love of her dang life, Ben, who she did not marry, by the way. It annoyed me because she talks about meeting Ben, her perfect man, on Raya, which is a dating app. And so in the same way that when she talks about having a one-night stand, she kind of is like, listen, I had a one-night stand, but I'm not a slut, but everyone should be able to have a one-night stand, but my one-night stand was perfect and in no way slutty. Is like, She does that again with dating apps, where she's like, listen, dating apps are fine. It's totally cool to do. I downloaded it kind of as a joke with my friend Vanessa Bayer, <laughs> and... I was on it for a couple hours, like maybe a day. And then I met Ben and then that was it. And so it's like, okay to be on dating apps, but not really. But I was only on it for a minute and it was like as a joke. But then I did meet someone and it's like, you could just be on dating apps. So and then she talks about how her ideas of love have been fucked up with the fact that both of her parents have been married three times. And of course, she gets into the stories about how everyone her dad married was crazy, but she never seems to think, oh, he shouldn't have married a crazy woman. It's like my poor dad married this crazy woman. Can you believe we all had to deal with her? There's never a sense of, like, what's wrong with my dad that he's marrying absolute crazos. Anyway, but she loves Ben. Well, she did. Not anymore. And so they have fun. She doesn't know where it'll end up, but... The last chapter is called Forgiving My Lower Back Tattoo, and this is where she, like, finally references the title and talks about she has a lower back tattoo that she got when she was young that her mom let her get. Her mom was like, fun idea. Let's go to the Lower East Side. When she was young, she was in her 20s, right? Yeah. So it's not like she was some child that her mom allowed to get a back tattoo. She was a full-grown adult who said she was going to do this thing, and her mom was like, okay, I'll come with. (laughs) Right. So she goes with her sister and her mom. She gets this lower back tattoo at, like, a shitty tattoo parlor, 
it, it gets infected. So it ends up healing kind of wonky looking and sh- it's just ugly. And she's yeah. like kind of ashamed of it. But then she's like, no, I'm not. But I am. But I'm not. Ironically, the tattoo mm-hmm. represents the opposite for me today. It reminds me that it's important to let yourself be vulnerable, to lose control and make a mistake. It reminds me, as Whitman would say, that I contain multitudes and I always will. I'm a level one introvert who headlined Madison Square Garden and was the first woman comic to do so. I'm the overnight success who worked her ass off for every single day, every single waking moment for more than a decade. I used to shoplift the kind of clothing that people now request I wear or give to them free for free publicity. I'm the slut or skank who's only had one one night stand. I'm a plus size six and a medium size 10. I've suffered the identical indignities of slinging ribeyes for a living and hustling laughs for cash. Blah, blah, blah. I'm proud of this ability to laugh at myself, even if everyone can see my tears, just like they can see my dumb, senseless, whack, lame, lower back tattoo. I don't know. Okay. Conclusions, Ash? Conclusions are, this book was nothing. I'm curious as to why she wrote it. For me, it seems like a cash grab, but as we learned in Chapter 3, she actually doesn't need the money. I do think it's kind of a cop-out to write, like, these deeply personal chunks amongst nothings and then be like, this isn't an autobiography. So what could you expect? Yeah. I mean, the thing, the parts I didn't hate weren't enough to make me like it. I felt that in a sea of nothing, there was a couple of gleaming glittering chapters of human honesty. But at the end of the day, I don't know that next week I'll remember a word in here. You guys, this week on the Patreon, we will be getting into the J-Lo documentary. We will be explaining how to start a podcast. Then also, if you have any, if you haven't, let us know if you want us to say anything more about Amy Schumer, other bits, and we can get into it there. I know Amy Schumer brings up a lot of feelings for a lot of people. Maybe yeah. not anymore. People have kind of forgotten about her. But let us know. We love you so much. And Ashley, who do we love the most? Thank you so much to nickname more like Chris name. Oh, we fucking love a Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much to Coco Chanel Tattoo. Baby, I will match with ya. Thank you to Dre Dre Chagrains. Baby, I would love a sugar grain any day of the week from you. Olive Brown. Whatever color olive you are, I'll paint my room it. Melissa the Morris. The Morris the Merrier, baby. T-Rex loves sugar cereal. With those tiny arms, I'll feed you your sugar cereal. Can't handle 15? Listen, if you can't handle 15, you're going to have a hard time at 16 handles. The number one frozen yogurt shop in Williamsburg. Alyssa, smiley face, smiley face right back at ya. Number one mer- wormy named Julia. Oh, I wish I could send you a plaque. Linda Linz, thank you for lending me this review. That's lending. Sus KRH, listen, you're not sus to me. Busy Bati, shake that Bati. Bit of bubbly, make it even more than a bit. A full glass, cheers, bitch. Your brown eyed girl, fucking meet me at karaoke, baby. Yeet an apartment. I'm about to yeet the entire apartment market, so I'm right behind you. Sarah ha 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 ha. The funniest thing I've read all day. Thank you guys so much. I love you to the friggin' moon and back. See you later.